So today, again, we're gathering on the porch. That's what's happening up here. It's a porch. Only today, our porch extends. We have beachfront property. We have property on the beach, and our porch just goes right out onto the beach, and the ocean or the seashore is just coming on in to us, and it's a lovely, peaceful setting. It's a beautiful place to be. There's fishing happening. They're sitting in the sun and the, and the breeze that comes off the water. It's just gorgeous here where we are on the beachfront property, on that porch that we're sitting on, relaxing and enjoying it. But something calls us to get up out of that, out of that easy chair that we're in, out of that beach chair, and calls us to get up and to, to start looking at some, some things about our lives. And it starts getting us to look inside of us about what's holding us back from living fully as faithful followers of Jesus the Christ. Because we're opening up John in the 21st chapter. It's a time with the risen Lord on the beach. For Jesus has come down to the lake shore, and there he sees that the disciples are out in the fishing boat. Because they have decided that what else can we do but go back to the old life that we once had before we met Jesus. He's gone now from our sight, and so they go back to fishing. They go back to what they know what to do and how to do it, and they're out there in the sea fishing. But you remember what happens. Nothing. They couldn't catch a thing. They were having no success. All night long they were fishing, and nothing. No catch at all. And then they see Jesus up on the shore. He's gathered up on the shore, and he's built a bit of a fire there on the shore. A barbecue's going on. He's got some coals burning, and he's starting to cook. And they see him up there, but they're not sure who it is. And he calls to them. And he says to them, like, hey, children, you haven't caught anything yet, have you? You see, Jesus knows what's happening in their lives. He knows the shift that's taken place and that they're being called to something deeper than the kind of fishing they've been doing. And so he calls to them, you haven't caught anything yet, have you? And they say, not a thing. And he just says to them, you take your net and you throw it out of the other side of the boat. They're fishermen. They've been fishing all their lives. They know how to do it. And so here's one from the shore who they think is Jesus, but they're not too sure, telling them what to do and how to do it. We always throw our nuts out on the left side of the boat, Jesus. We always fish just like this, Jesus. We never do it out the right side of the boat. But Jesus called them to do it. And so they followed him. They listened to what he said for them to do. Because they learned that in their discipleship time with him as they've been following him. They learned that you do what Jesus says to do. And so they did. And they caught a net full of fish. They caught so many fish that they couldn't even bring them into the boat. It was an amazing moment. And there was a revelation, an epiphany that happened with Peter at that moment. He realized fully, it is the Lord in our midst. And he just jumped into the water, just like Peter does. He just jumped into the water with abandon and just swam as fast as he could up to the shore to see Jesus. May we do so here and now as we gather for worship. May we do it.
Let us open the Bible and let us hear God's word from John in that 21st chapter. The Bible you brought with you, chapter 21, or that pew Bible, that red Bible there in the front of you, open that up. and It's in the New Testament on page 109. For the new day has just begun. The disciples had been out on that lake being challenged, trying their hardest, having no results, and the sun was just coming up, a new day. The sun was just breaking through. The shadows were there cast on that beach. So they looked up onto the beach, and they could see a figure there, but weren't sure quite who it was who was standing there in that shadowy time of the day, but also of their lives. A shadowy time when they weren't sure what they were seeing or what they should believe anymore, or what to do even, who they were. It was that time of the day, that time of their life. And there they were, the bright colors were just starting to show in the sky, coming up on that day. And there was one there who had just lit a fire. And there it was. A fire was coming and there were nice coals and it was a glow that was there. And Peter just roared up onto shore there as fast as he could. And the others in the boat were rowing ashore with all those fish in the net. They were just dragging behind them. And there, Peter joins with Jesus up on the shore. And I begin with verse 15. When they had finished breakfast... Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? And he said to him, Yes, Lord, you know that I love you. And Jesus said to him, Feed my lambs. And a second time Jesus said to him, Simon, son of John, do you love me? And he said to me, Yes, Lord, you know that I love you. And Jesus said to him, Tend my sheep. He said to him the third time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Peter felt hurt because he said to him the third time, do you love me? And he said to him, Lord, you know everything. You know that I love you. And Jesus said to him, feed my sheep. Very truly, I tell you, when you were younger, you used to fasten your own belt and to go wherever you wished. But when you grow old, you will stretch out your hand and someone else will fasten a belt around you and take you where you do not wish to go. He said this to indicate the kind of a death by which he would glorify God. After this, he said to him, follow me. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. So Peter and the other disciples, they gathered around that fire that Jesus had made right there, a fire that he had, wait a minute here, we got to light this fire, don't we? We can't have a fire without it being lit, huh? Oh, maybe I shouldn't, huh? I can't even get this thing to go. I'm not sure anyway. Our trustees probably wouldn't quite like that. But how can you have a, a smell of smoke and charcoal burning without it being lit, without there being a fire that comes? A fire that, that burns and it glows and it, and it warms us. And it's something about a fire there on the beach that's just so dear and warming and comforting and, and, and calling to us. You ever sit around a campfire and your eyes just seem to just move on into that flame and watch it dance and it kind of calls to you. Jesus was calling to Peter and the other disciples there on the, on the beach, and, and that fire attracted them, and Jesus' Holy Spirit attracted them to him, and there they enjoyed a breakfast together. You know, it's something that I hadn't really, really noticed in this passage that precedes the part we read is that after Peter he jumped out of the boat, came to shore, and the other disciples, they couldn't get the, all the, the six of them in the boat. They couldn't get the net full of fish into the boat. It was too heavy, too many fish. Jesus went up all by himself onto the shore. The others joined him. And when, when the others joined him, there was Jesus. And Jesus said, Peter, go get some fish. Peter went back to the boat that they had finally come to shore with. And the fish were there in the net, not in the boat, because they couldn't lift them. And Peter, by himself, takes a hold of that net full of fish. 153, it says, big fish. And he takes a hold of that net, and he drags it all the way up to Jesus, because that's Peter. Peter is filled with passion. He's filled with energy. He's filled with strength, too. 
Peter has strength in his body, a strong man who has been fishing his whole life, a strong man in his physical body. But there on the beach that day, he needs another strength, a different strength. He has a strength in the power of his physical being, but now he needs to go from strength to strength, a new strength, a strength he needs to find in his own spirit, which weakened when Jesus left, which weakened when Jesus wasn't right there in front of him, encouraging him along the way. He needed a new strength in his very heart, in his mind, in his, in his spiritual life. There he was in front of that fire that was burning, and they were having breakfast together. You know how it is when you have that fire, that smell that comes up, the charcoal that's burning and the flames that are there. It somehow triggers the memories that are within us, the smell of the smoke that's there. A memory will come, they say, first from smell, and it will be associated with something deep in us, a smell that comes to us, something that came from the first time we smelled that aroma, whether it's good or bad. It'll come and it'll flood and wash back over us, like the smoke from the fire just wafting over Peter at that moment. He would have been remembering, remembering back not long ago. It's recorded in John in the 18th chapter. That's where Peter was in front of a different barbecue fire. It was a barbecue fire out in front of Caiaphas's home where Jesus was there being tried. And you remember that story when Peter was there at that fire, and Peter said, Jesus, I'm never ever going to deny you. But what happened at that barbecue that day when the coals were burning brightly and that smell was coming off the fire, a time when Peter crumbled in his spirit and there was a weakness that was there within him. And he denied Jesus once, twice, three times. Was it that memory that would have been coming forth from Peter that day on the beach when he was before yet another charcoal fire, a barbecue that was going on on the beach? But this time Jesus was there by his side. Maybe it would be different this time. How could he overcome that place of shame, that place of deep pain, that place where he had betrayed, denied Jesus? How would he ever be able to come overcome that moment in his life? Things trigger our memories, and they just wash over us sometimes and just bring us to our knees. You have those kind of memories too. Whether it be a smell that does it for you, an odor and aroma that comes to you, that just gives you a renewed spirit and a comfort in your heart, or tears that come even. Memories that come from the smell that maybe those lilies on an Easter Sunday and they bring cheer and joy to you, but maybe those lilies also remind you of a dear one's memorial funeral service and the emotion just washes over us from that aroma that comes. Or maybe it's a sound that you hear from one of the hymns that we sing. We begin worship with the beautiful hymns this morning. Uh, and they spark within us a lot of different kind of memories, some that have expression and we can identify them, but others that just kind of are flood over us. And sometimes, have you ever noticed it, that a dear hymn and a beloved hymn and, and an amazing grace that sung can be so dear to us that they bring tears to our eyes, tears that become mixed with sorrow and with joy, the sound that comes into our ears, the smells that come into our, into our nostrils the senses that just stir within us so much. That was Peter that day, overwhelmed with the whole scene and everything happening. He would have been remembering that day and that time in front of Caiaphas's home when he denied Jesus. But there was Jesus this time, letting him know of a new call that he had for Peter, still a call for him. It was another seashore a long time before, years earlier, that, that John and the other Gospels recorded the way that Jesus called Peter and the other disciples forth when they were fishing and said, come and follow me. And they all followed enthusiastically. They all came forward and went with Jesus to learn, to grow, uh, with all of their questions about whether they had, were capable enough or not or could really do what, what this 
rabbi was calling them to do and who he was calling them to be. But they just went with him freely. They just put down defenses and put down the considerations and put down all the reasons why not and just went with Jesus then. They trusted him. They saw something in Jesus, and so do you, don't you? You know who Jesus is, and you trust him, and so you put down the defenses, and you put down the reasons why not, and you just go with Jesus. So did Peter then, years earlier. And so much happened then in that in-between time. And now here he is at another moment of decision-making. What will he do? Will he let all that happened in those last days of Jesus' life on earth define him? Will he let Caiaphas, the high priest, define him? Will he let the Roman soldiers who nailed Jesus to the cross define him? Or will he make it so that Jesus himself is the one who says, Peter, this is who you are. Peter, that day in front of the barbecue, he made a new decision. He made a new decision to follow Jesus again. When Jesus began asking him questions, it seemed like the same question over and over again, didn't it? And Peter himself even got a little frustrated with it. Why are you asking me three times if I love you? You know that I love you, Jesus. You know it. But Peter needed convincing in his heart and his mind that there's forgiveness for him. You see, that's where Peter needed to be freed. He needed to be freed from the sins that he had um, committed. He, he needed to be freed from the ways that he betrayed Jesus, but others, all others. He was the disciple who was the leader, and he fell, and he stumbled. He was the one who should have been leading them in the first place, but he was the one who gave up. Peter needed that moment with Jesus on the beach. But so do I, and so do you. We need to hear Jesus calling to us, saying, you love me. You love me, don't you? I, th I think Jesus was even just telling Peter, I know that you love me, Peter, but just giving Peter that other chance to profess the faith, to say, this is who I am, and this is what the desire of my heart is, Jesus. I love you. I love you. Then feed my sheep. Feed my lamb, take care of him, tend the flock, be the shepherd. Jesus has been the shepherd. Jesus has been the one who has led the disciples as the shepherd for the sheep. And now Jesus is saying to Peter, be the shepherd. Wow, what a, what a turn of events. What a reversal or a turn of roles. What a marvelous gift to Peter of an affirmation to him about Peter I love you, I trust you, here is the kingdom. Be the shepherd for the sheep. Take hold of this gift of ministry and do it. I know that you can, Peter. You love me, and that's all that's needed. That's all that's needed. A love for the Lord and just giving ourselves into the Lord and trusting the Lord. It was in those moments then when Jesus gave to Peter the gift of mercy of grace, of forgiveness, that Peter was able to fully and faithfully follow Jesus and be freed from sin, from that betrayal, be freed from all of the reasons why he couldn't do that ministry that Jesus had been doing. Think about it for yourself. When you look into Jesus' life and we see all that Jesus has been doing in his life about teaching and healing and, and confronting the evils in the world, and now Jesus is calling Peter to do that, I don't know. I would have second doubts whether or not I would have what it would take to do what Jesus did fully and faithfully. Those times of questions of a doubt, they just flit and flirt through our minds whether or not we can do so. We can see all sorts of reasons why we have failed or will fail about that ministry in all of its fullness. And so we just kind of flirt with being disciples of Jesus a little bit here and a little bit there. It's never fully and faithfully. It's always just kind of partially and a little bit at it about being a disciple of Jesus. I think mostly because we don't believe that we can do it. We don't believe that we can be the shepherd for the sheep, that we can heal as Jesus calls us to, 
that we can offer mercy, that we can be the life-giving Word of God in this world that's crazy and mixed up and dangerous and dark. But Jesus calls us to. And on that beach that day, Jesus said those words to Peter that his heart needed, and so does yours. A statement of faith being made, do you love me, is what Jesus asks of each one of us. Do you love me? Then live the life of a disciple and feed the sheep. Do the ministry and the mission that you're called to do and do it in a mighty powerful way, just as powerful as you did it when you jumped out of the boat and you swam as fast as you could, just as powerful and mighty as you did, Peter, when you went out and you got that, that, that net full of fish and you dragged it up to the shore all by yourself when nobody else can do it, just as powerfully as you did that, just as powerfully as you came forward with rage when others were arresting me, Jesus would say to Peter, just as much as you've done it in that way, tend the sheep, feed the flock, do the ministry, be the church, just as powerfully and as strong as you can, as you have within you. Peter was called to go from strength into a new strength, and he discovered and experienced that through the gift of mercy that Jesus gave to him. For Jesus called him to feed the sheep, to tend the flock, even though he had failed and denied and given up so many times. Even though he may have been dim-witted on many an occasion and not understood the parables and not understood the teachings and not understood what Jesus was trying to do and said, Jesus, never go to Jerusalem. Stay here in Galilee where it's safe and where it's comfortable. Peter didn't understand so much, so often. But Jesus looked into him and said, all you need is to love me. Like, like we have been taught what is that greatest of commandments? To love the Lord your God with all of your heart, with all of your mind, your soul, your spirit, your strength. To love the Lord your God and to love your neighbor. Peter, do you love me? Then feed my sheep. Love God. Love your neighbor. It's all there. Jesus said it and taught it all the way through his life, over and over again, in how many ways? And what keeps us from doing so? It is often trusting then, trusting that, what God, that God's love is enough, trusting that, that God gifts us in ways that are sufficient and total and complete as a church and as individuals, that we can do this mighty act of ministry wherever we are in whatever circumstance, that we can live faithfully in our homes, in our families, in our communities, in our places of work, wherever you are in your life. Whatever that job is that you have, you can there, in that place, be a faithful follower of Jesus right then and there because God has given you everything that you need to do that. All you do in that situation, in that place, is love God and love your neighbor. That's it. And God will just give you all of the strength that you have. I tell you where you can often discover that and see that strength that just comes upon you is when you look into another with whom it's hard to love and you discover and you learn and you experience and you practice falling in love with them. When there's somebody in your life, in your world, in which you're not sure that you can love them with your whole heart, you're not sure that you can channel in and give into them the grace of Jesus. You're not sure about that. And as you pray over that, and as you look into their life, and you look for Jesus there, and you look for Christ looking back at you, and you find yourself coming into love with that person, there is a power that's there that's life-giving, that lifts us up and that gives us a newfound strength. Where there was weakness, we have new strength moving from one strength into another strength as we learn about and experience and practice that loving of Jesus. So when our administrative board was meeting this last week, 
I shared an opening time with them as we had a devotion as we opened up, and it was just kind of about that, about how to love the enemy and about how to, how to forgive others and how to be the people of God, be the disciples of Jesus in that way. And I reflected upon a time the week before up at camp when I was serving and working with the youth at camp, a, a challenging time that would take every bit of my strength, physical strength, yes, but also emotional and spiritual strength because you're fully taxed in that kind of a situation 24-7, just living with other people. It, it, it's a hard thing to do who are outside of your own home, but there we are, thrust together as a community. You will be the church, in essence, we're told. Make it work. So we're up there on a mountaintop, a half-do place. Nobody can leave, and there we are, stuck there with each other in some respects. Oh, yeah, there were many there who I could just easily enough get along with, and everything would be wonderful with, and, and we would just have much enjoyment. But there were others, as there always are for us, that would push the buttons, you know, <laughs> that would challenge me in ways that I think, oh, you know, the camp would be better if that one just wasn't here. You know, I hate to, no, it just, that was a fleeting moment and then it's gone. But there is that time, always, in every community that we're a part of, where we will be challenged about how do we love fully? How do we accept and embrace others? And there was one young man who just challenged me at every moment. From the very start of camp, he was a challenge. I'd known him before. I'd known him in previous camps. And I think there was this little prayer in the back of my head that said, oh, Lord, may, maybe he can't come this year. <laughs> but I know better than that because that's exactly why I'm at camp. It's for him. That's why exactly we're there together in the community. Not just for him, but for me too to experience the power of loving someone I'm challenged to love and to grace. So it was for all of us together to make it so. So after camp was over, coming home and trying to get my feet back on the ground, and it was, a, it was on a Monday then. I just came back into the office just for a brief time, and I had a message that was there. It was that kid's mother. She had called me and wanted to talk. I always wonder about that after camp, you know. A mom calls me up and says, we got to talk. I thought, oh boy, what did I do? You know, what happened that was up there that somebody got upset or somebody got angry or something didn't go well? And so I called her back and she said, I just want to know, what did you do to my son? I thought of a lot of things maybe I wanted. No, no, I, <laughs> not at all. And there was that moment of silence there. And then I finally just said, tell me a little bit more here. <laughs> <laughs> and she said, he came back a different young man than he when he went to camp. He's brand new. I'm not even sure I know my boy right now. He is filled with a new life. He is filled with a new kind of a, he, his power doesn't come from his anger, he, she said. His power is coming from care, from, from a tenderness even. And I never thought I would say that about my son. He's different. What did you do to my son? Thank you. And I said to her, it wasn't I. It was the Lord in our midst. It was the Lord who calls us around those campfires at camp and a charcoal fire. It says, do you love me? And where we experience a power of a love that just transforms our lives. And I came to connect with that young man at camp in a meaningful, powerful, honest, sincere way where our lives connected together. And my life was changed through him too. And so was his. It's the power of Jesus and loving him and seeing Jesus in one another and letting his mercy just be there and wash over us gives us a brand new strength, new meaning in life and purpose, total purpose. You know, there comes that time in a week at camp in which you wonder, I'm not sure if I can have enough strength to do this next year because every year you take another look, am I going to go and lead another camp? 
It's often not the time to ask somebody to take on camp at the very end of it, you know. <laughs> Usually you've got to wait a few days or a few weeks or a few months afterward when you regather your strength and you realize, yeah, that was a powerful, mighty thing, but the camp director could have asked me at that moment. And she did. And I said, yes, you can count on me to be there next year because that's the church being fully faithful followers of Jesus and loving people who need to be loved and gracing others and setting ourselves free. I was set free, and so was that young man, just like Peter was set free. May that be so for you, too. Church, do you love Jesus? Do you? Do you love Jesus? Church, do you love Jesus? Yeah. Do you love Jesus? Yeah. <laughs> so we follow him. Wherever he calls us to go, we walk with Jesus. Let us do so now. Let us walk with the master wherever he calls us. i